Are you ready to come to the table? I love that song. It says a lot. All you saints, all you sinners, come to the table. You know, that table is set uh, before us. It's a table that everyone's welcome at. And that, to me, is not only amazing, but it is a blessing. This morning, we're going to continue our walk. And Jared, we're going to plan A, not B, okay? Um, I gave Jared a heads up uh, out at Gateway um, that I might be changing my mind on how I uh, uh, did the sermon, and I decided to stick with the original plan, okay? Um, so if you have your Bibles, open them to Philippians chapter 1. We're going to finish it up. We're going to look at three verses um, t uh, this morning and apply them to our lives, where we are and what's going on in the... Uh, I want to say the difficulties of life. Anybody have a difficult life besides me? No, I know. I, it's, it's a bed of roses, right? That's what we're promised. Um, I woke up this morning and um, at, at about 5 o'clock and I was laying there and I realized that the TV was on. And that's never a good sign. I rolled over and my wife is laying there wide awake and it's like, why are you awake? And it's like, she's, and I love my grandsons, but you know, when you decide to watch them, no good deed goes unpunished, okay? Four o'clock on Friday, on Saturday morning, we get, Nana, I had a bad dream. Nope, I'm going to puke. And so Lisa's up from four till and I was up too, but I slept in between four till about oh six o'clock with a puking little boy. And yesterday was beautiful. We went to Bannock, thought we missed all of it. It was going to be good. And this morning I wake up to, it isn't good, honey. <laughs> it isn't good. So um, if I'm not real greedy and huggy this morning, it's because I may be infected. Okay. <laughs> And if you want to blame anybody, his name is Wes. Okay? His name is Wes. But, you know, I mean, it's one of those things where and it, we don't... Sometimes we struggle with those things in life. Anybody else? I mean, it's like, why, Lord? It's Sunday morning. It, it, Sunday morning, it, we've dedicated all week to get ready for one day. Can we not have peace? Nope. We can't. The Philippians kind of find themselves in the same place. You know, I would not consider what happened this morning persecution. I would just consider it life, okay? But we all live one, don't we? All live one. And Paul addresses the Philippian church. He says, above all, you must live as citizens of heaven, conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the good news of, about Christ. Then whether I come to see you again or will only hear about you, I will know that you're standing together with one spirit, one purpose, fighting together for the faith, which is the good news. Do not be intimidated in any way by your enemies. This will be a sign to them that they will be going to be destroyed, but that you are going to be saved, even by God himself. For, for you have been given not only the privilege of trusting in Christ, but also the privilege of suffering for Him. We are in this struggle together. You have seen my struggle in the past, and you know that I am still in the midst of it. I love that. We're in it together, guys. We're in it together. Paul has focused so far in the letter as we kind of march verse by verse through the first chapter. He's been focused on, on the... The, the great privilege and the excitement that he had and how thankful he was that the Philippian church partnered with him for the spreading of the gospel of Jesus. They took up an offering at one point. Listen, they were sending in a supporting church of the mission work called church planting. Okay, a difficult work. And I want to praise God. Listen, at Gateway this morning, 
we had five guests. I want to praise God for that. And I want you to pray, okay? Pray. When you're in the church plant, and sometimes we here forget that we're in the church planting business and that our southern campus is just starting. When you get five new people, it's like having, you know, the greatest day that you can have, okay? And it was not only five new people, it was five new people from the community, okay? And they, some of them knew each other and some of them didn't. So pray for that church plant. But as we think about this, you know, Paul is encouraging the believers. I don't need Zach to call me. Okay. Paul is encouraging the believers. That's one thing. I love Apple, but it all connects together. So you can tell Zach I ignored him. Okay. Bill will be there in a minute. Um, but call, Paul is going to encourage the believers to be unified. To be unified. You know, he's going to encourage them... Uh, as he focuses on some underlying current things now that are going on in the church. So not problems that have arised, but potential. And he's going to give them great encouragement and encourage them to follow Christ. To follow Christ because of who he is and what he's done for us. And a lot of times we struggle with that, don't we? Because we tend to get focused on other things Instead of focusing on what we should. Paul said just a few verses earlier, he says, For me to die is to gain, but to live is Christ. To follow, to become like Christ, to be who he's called us to be. You know, he, he says there in verse 27, he says, Above all, you must live as citizens of heaven, conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the good news. Then whether I come to see you again or only hear about you, I will know that you're standing together with one spirit, one purpose. Fighting the good fight. Fighting together for the faith, which is the good news. And don't be intimidated by your enemies. I mean, as we think about this, guys, Paul was confident that God was still had work for him to do. We saw that earlier, last week. And so he's going to urge the Philippians, whether he, you know, sees it himself or only hears about it, that they would live in a manner worthy of their calling. A manner worthy of the good news. And what does that look like? What does it mean to live, live in that manner? Well, Paul gave the same... Uh, uh, command to the Ephesian church. In Ephesians 4.1, he says, Therefore, I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling. For you've been called by God. Always be humble. Humility. Don't think of yourself too much. We live in a time and a place where it's all about me. We live in a society that tells us it's all about you. What you want, you desire, and we become very self-absorbed. We become very proud. He says, live humbly. He says, be gentle. Be gentle. You know, I have a hard time with that, okay? I really do. I, I tend to be harsh. That, that's my nature, I was brought up where you cowboy up and you move on and you either suck it up or you get left behind. Let's go. Okay? That's how I was brought up. But that isn't being gentle. Okay? I have to learn to be gentle. I have to learn to care. And it's something that we must focus on. And he says, making allowances for others' faults because of your love. When we look around, listen, you don't have to know me very long and my faults come right to the surface. I got news for you. I don't have to know you very long and your faults come right to the surface. Because is anybody here perfect? Anybody got this Christian life figured out? Anybody know how, you know, you're to live every moment of every day of your life? How many of us just live the way that we know we should? See, it's easy to start picking each other apart. It takes patience. It takes love to overlook each other's faults. 
and I'm going to have good days and bad days just like you. We're going to struggle together sometimes to get along because you're not perfect like me and don't have all the right answers and you don't think like me. And See, it's easy for me to pick on me, but the truth is that can be said about you. Whether it be in our relationships as brothers and sisters here at the bridge or with our relationships with our spouse or our kids. To be patient. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. Too often we make every effort to divide ourselves, to separate ourselves, to make it about me, myself, and I. He says make every effort to be united. Listen, I've been married for, for 32 years in August, okay? If you don't think it's taking great effort on Lisa's part to be united with me, you're fooling yourself. <laughs> Listen, we can't be united by accident as husband and wife. By accident, we will be totally divided. Listen, honestly, I don't work at my marriage. I really don't. I don't look at it as work because it's a labor of love. I feel closer to my wife today, 32 years later, more in love, more passionate about being with her, knowing her, than I did on the day that I married her. Why? Because I've made every effort in love to be united. See, we have to choose those things. We have to choose to be united because our enemy is all about dividing us. You know, I joke a lot and I, and I, tell, I tell a lot of, uh, or use a lot of sarcasm. But the truth is, guys, listen, our enemy is roaring like a lion. And Paul writing to the church in Ephesus says this, Therefore, I, a prisoner of the Lord... Oh, sorry, wrong one. Ah, Got to stay with it. I'm getting ahead of myself. Paul called them to live as citizens of heaven. Citizens of heaven. And that's the way they should live. Let me ask you, do you live like a citizen of heaven? Do you see that, that your... Citizenship in heaven is greater than your citizenship as a United States citizen. See, the Philippian church, the, the, the Philippi was, was a Roman colony, a Roman citizen, uh, 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 city. And their citizens were proud to be Romans. Listen, I'll be honest with you, I'm very proud to be an American. I've traveled. No matter where I travel, no matter where I go, it doesn't matter if it's in Europe or if it's in Africa or if it's in South America. I would trade no country for my country. Agreed? It's the best place to live in spite of all its troubles. Now listen, I've been to beautiful places. Africa has my heart. Okay? I mean, it has it. Honestly, when Lisa and I retire... Okay, we're not retiring next week. It'll be next month, okay? Um, no, when we retire, our goal is to go to Africa. Go to Africa and spend months there because it has my heart. But Africa is not a place that I want to move my citizenship to. You see, with citizenship comes responsibilities. We, grow, we now live in a place and a time where, you know, we want all the privileges of being a U.S. citizen without the responsibilities of it. We live in a place and time where our government owes us something. We live in a place and a time where what Kennedy said, you know, ask not what your government can do for you or your country do for you, but what you can do for your country is lost. Now listen, not lost for everybody. We got men and women in our congregation that serve our country, love our country. I'm talking, okay, as a whole. 
The responsibilities that we have as a, as a U.S. citizen to, to support, encourage, and to build up our, our, our citizenship, our, our, our nation are lost. We want to take and take. But listen, the same is true for the church. We, we come to know Christ and we, want, we become as if the God owes us something. It's a great privilege for, uh, for Him to have us as His kid. We don't take the responsibilities that He asks. And He doesn't ask a lot of us. He just asks for all of us. He wants all of our time, all of our money, all of our effort, all of our talents, all of our stuff. He wants it all. He asks for it all. You say, whoa, 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 I can't do it. No. Yeah, you really can surrender it all at His feet. And begin to live as a citizen for heaven and it's amazing the blessings that you will receive. And we have to see that we have a high calling to be called the children of God, to be citizens of heaven. He says, live in a manner worthy of your calling, worthy of that good news that has changed not only your life, but can change everybody else's life. We have a responsibility to share it. We have a responsibility to support it, to encourage it, <coughs> to participate in it. But yet the honest truth is most of us want to sit and just take from it. You see, when you get in the fight and you're part of the team, suddenly you see how important that is. You see, when, a believer, when, a believer, when we become believers, we become God's children, heirs of His promises and members of His body. Romans 8, 17, Paul said, And since we are His children, we are His heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are our heirs of, of God's glory. But we are to share, if we are to share His glory, we must also share His suffering. And see, right there, we don't want that last sentence, that last part. We want His glory, we want the privileges, we want the, the blessings, but we don't want to share in the suffering, the giving of ourselves away. You know, this privilege that we have was bought with a very great price. We don't even consider the price of our salvation. In our day-to-day -day lives, we want, we want, we want, but we don't see what it took to get us. 1 Peter 1, 18 says, For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your fathers or your ancestors. And the ransom he paid was not mere silver or gold. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. Have you considered that? Your citizenship was not just something trivial. It's not just because you signed on a dotted line. It's not just because you became a member of a church. It's not just because you suddenly one day decided, but in fact you were bought and paid for with the blood of the Lamb of God, with the blood of Christ. And as believers, we should reflect Christ. He is our King. We should reflect what it means to be part of His kingdom. We ought to reflect Jesus' humility and His gentleness and His patience, His understanding, His peacefulness. His strength, His endurance, His gratitude towards God. Sometimes we're the most ungrateful people I know. We struggle with what it means to be a citizen of heaven. You know, Paul hoped that whether he, he returned or whether he would only hear about it, that he would see that they, as a body, were standing side by side fighting the fight. You see, the Holy Spirit unites Christians into one spiritual group. You know, when the America is polled, when, when the, the public is polled, they don't see denominations. Did you know that? They see Christian, and it doesn't matter what group. But what do they see when they look at the group? A group of people that fight amongst themselves. They don't see us united as the body of Christ. They see us divided amongst those things that separate us. 
They see the Baptists fighting against the Pentecostals and the Pentecostals fighting against the Presbyterians and the Presbyterians fighting against the Lutherans and they do not see us as a united body of Christ. And yet he calls us to be united behind one purpose, one cause. And it's not a Baptist cause, it's not a Presbyterian cause, it is not a Pentecostal cause. It is the cause of the kingdom. That the gospel of Jesus Christ would be shared with every man, woman, and child that lives on the face of the planet. The cause that, Je that God said through Paul, it is not my will that any man should perish, but all should come to repentance and knowledge of the truth. That's the cause we should be united behind. Now listen, should we as a church, as a body, kind of take on the posture that we're the only one with the good news and if we don't go share, nobody else will hear? Absolutely. But if we bump into somebody along the way, we still need to understand that they're part of the body of Christ and we should support their work and encourage them. Paul says, whether I am set free or am able to come and see you again, or whether I remain in prison, I want to hear that you're standing together in the Lord. Listen, Satan wants to divide us. You know, Paul also wanted to hear that they were fighting. Listen, as an Irishman, I love that term. Okay? But he doesn't say he wants us to fight amongst ourselves. He doesn't want us to fight over whether we have pews or chairs or whether the carpet's green or blue. He doesn't want us to fight over whether the music's too loud or you can't, or whatever it is. He doesn't want us to fight over those things. But listen, what do we spend our time arguing and squabbling about? Those things that in the end are going to be burned up and done away with. He wants to hear that they're fighting together for the good news. That they've locked arms behind one purpose and said, you know what? You may not believe exactly like I believe, or you may like something different than I like it, but for the sake of the kingdom of God, we're going to stand together and we're going to fight. We're not going to quit. You know, sometimes I think being born Irish was to my detriment. Okay? And Bill it being a Brit, okay? I love Bill, but he's a bloody Brit, and I mean, there's nothing we can do to help the man, okay? <laughs> Okay? But guess what? When I lock arms with that man, hundreds, thousands years of history between my people and his people, and not much of it good. You know, my grandfather, who was a red-headed Irishman, okay, 300 pounds of full-bodied red-headed Irishman, <clears throat> would tell you the best thing about being born Irish was he wasn't born a bloody Brit. <laughs> would lock arms with anyone that would stand for the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have to stop worrying about the petty stuff and focus on the main thing. We live in a world that's lost and dying and going to hell. And without the good news, there is no hope for them. We must grow them up. We must reach them and, be, and be, help them become like Christ. Paul, writing to the Romans, says, Just as our bodies have many parts, and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body, and we all belong to each other. That's locally, here at the bridge, and globally, as the church. You know, a lot of times we, we, we get discouraged because we're not, you know, quote, fulfilling the role that we felt like we're called to fulfill and be. I understand that, you know, I, I, I think that baseball is a true gift from God to mankind, okay? I'm just saying. All right? And I love the game. I love to play it. I love to watch it. I love the strategy. I love to, to think about it and the numbers and the, and the percentages. And, and you know, the, the key to baseball is being able to do the same thing over and over again every time, okay? Which is one of the most difficult things for humans to do, discipline. Listen, I was an above average catcher. Above average. I went to high school. And for four years, I played second string. I played uh, uh, left bench was my spot. 
behind a super athlete, my best friend. Now, I had a choice to make as a freshman when I figured out real quick I wasn't going to be the starting catcher for the next four years. My role was going to be sit on the bench, go warm up the pitcher, take the beating from a kid who threw 95 to 100 miles an hour. Take the beating while he warmed up so he could hit the target. I had to make a decision. Is that going to be my role? Am I going to be the punching bag? And I decided, you know what, I'm going to be a team player. And so I developed other things. Yeah, I could go take the beating, warm up the, the pitchers and, and catch all batting practice because you didn't want to wear out your good catcher and all of those. I could do that. And it was like, you know, God, I want to get in the game. In four years, I caught one baseball game, and it was a practice game. Yeah, oh, I wanted in the game. Until I realized that I was the 10th player on the field every time they got up. Because, see, some people call it cheating. I call it just being an uh, observing mankind, okay? And if you're not going to hide what you're doing... There's guys like me who will watch you long enough. I'll figure out what your next move is. So I'd steal the signs from the catcher. I'd steal the signs from the, uh, from the base coaches. I became the 10th player because I'd tell everybody what was going to happen before it happened. <laughs> because he understood that I was part of a team. And together we would win. Individually we would lose. No matter how much superstar Tim, my best friend, was. No matter how much superstar Greg, or, uh, Greg Dyson was. It didn't matter. We won as a team, not as individuals. And you see, we face opposition. We have faced opponents. Our church is, it, the enemy is continually attacking he attacks with discouragement and detachment and, and all of those things that are growing pains. And he makes mountains out of mole hills. But the truth of the matter is our attacks are evident that we're on the right path. That we're headed the right direction. Because if we weren't, guess what he would do? Just leave them alone. There are no consequence to my kingdom or the kingdom of God. In fact, in fact... They're on my side, is what our enemy would say. But because we keep calling each other to a higher standard, to live in that manner worthy that we're calling, is it perfect? No. It doesn't mean that God's looking for perfect people. What it means is, is that He's looking for us to begin to live like Him, act like Him, love like Him, be like Him. You know, He says, don't be intimidated by your enemies. You know, Paul faced a lot of opposition. He understood what it meant to be persecuted. He understood what it meant to fight against an enemy. And the truth of the matter is, listen, when I begin to see an enemy, I rarely have... I, I, listen, do I believe in demonic forces? Absolutely. Okay, I believe they're roaming around, roaring like a lion. But here's the truth of the matter. Most of the time I can put a human face to them. It's the truth. He uses us, and sometimes I'm used by the enemy. One unkind word, one thing that's said in, 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 in jest that is taken wrong, and, and the enemy tries to use it and, and destroy us with it. The same thing is with you. Listen, it takes courage for a church to resist the infighting and focus on what, the most com what, what needs to be the most important thing, sharing the gospel and forgiving and loving each other. Paul said this, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against powers, against the world forces of darkness, against spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Too often people don't do what's necessary to stand firm. They only take the position of flight. We must stand firm. We must stand united. Paul said that, you know, there were two things that were sure about those who persecute the church. 
the destruction of our opponents, and the salvation of believers. Did you catch that? Paul, in that, in that passage, talked about the destruction of our opponents and our belief and our salvation being secure. He said to the church in, Thessalon in Thessalonica, he said in 2 Th Thessalonians verse, chapter 1, verses 5, he says, God will use this persecution to show his justice and to make you worthy of his kingdom for which you are suffering. In his justice, he will pay back those who persecute you. And God will provide rest for you who are being persecuted and also for us when the Lord Jesus appears from heaven. He will come with, a mighty, with, with mighty angels in a flaming fire, bringing judgment on those who do not know God and those who refuse to obey the good news of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with eternal destruction forever, separated from the Lord and from his glorious power. When he comes that day, he will receive glory from his holy people and praise from all who believe. And this will include you, for you have believed what, what we have told you about him. Do we believe that God is in control and that he is just? Verse 29, for you have been given not only the privilege of trusting Christ, but also the privilege of suffering for Him. Do we really consider it a privilege to be called by His grace? To have the opportunity to believe and to worship? Listen, they also had the privilege of suffering. Do you think the suffering that we, that we have is a privilege? See, there's this bill of goods that's sold that when you become a Christian, that it you know, becomes a bed of roses and, and everything's perfect. Amen? No more suffering, no more pain, no more hurt. And you wake up the next morning and you wake up in the same place that you fell asleep. It's a broken world that we live in. We get upset when we get a little, you know, the government pushes back on the church or a school system or, or uh, uh, some group pushes back on, oh, we're persecuted. Oh, grow up. We have yet to suffer persecution, folks. And the little suffering that we do when we try to overcome sin and we're tempted and we fall and we, and oh, listen. Paul wanted believers in Philippi to understand that suffering persecution was not a punishment for their sins, nor was it an accident that somehow God would use everything for His glory and our good. And yes, and everyone who wants to live godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Have you suffered at all for your faith? Because you took a stand for what was right? Have you stood up and fought? If you haven't, you're not suffering any persecution or any struggle. Let me ask, do you have faith? We're going to close with the last verse. Paul says, we are in this struggle together. Listen, there's no other way to be like Jesus except through the pain and the suffering. He called us to take up our cross, an instrument of pain and an instrument of suffering. Have you taken up your cross? You see, even in the hard times, even under the enemy's attacks, even through the difficult days, We're to have one single, we're to have singleness of mind that the gospel of Jesus Christ would be spread. Not that our needs would be met. We're going to ask the worship team to come up. I want to encourage us that our enemy is attacking us. 
He wants to destroy us, whether it's through discouragement or complacency. He wants to destroy us, whether it's through arguments or silence. But that we as a body must make a choice and a decision to continue to fight the good fight, to support and encourage the good news to be spread, to take part as citizens of heaven, that we would be like Christ, that when the world sees us, they would say, I want to be like that. Because they see Jesus in us. Let's pray. Father, I praise you and I thank you. I thank you for your great love. And I pray, Father God, that through the power of your spirit that you truly would unite us. Father, we do not wage war against flesh and blood, but against an enemy that is seated in high places. So as a citizen of heaven, Father, I come against him and wage war against our enemy, Father. The enemy that causes discouragement, the enemy that causes us to focus on ourselves and to focus on the minor problems and, the, and not want to participate. The enemy, Father, that causes us to, to want to shrink back. I come against him in the mighty name of Jesus. It is in and through his blood, Father, that we have that power and that authority. Father, may we be united as one body for one purpose, Father, to go and make disciples. Father, to bring a lost and dying world to the cross, that they too would grow to be like Christ. Help us to take seriously our responsibility to grow and mature believers, Father. To step out in faith and to do that which is necessary, Father. Maybe for the first time, Father, maybe for the thousandth time. That at the end of our days, we would hear, well done. Father, we give you the glory and the praise. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.